Well, our next speaker in our conference, we've taken full advantage to have him be available here for Sunday morning. Walid Shubat is going to be again speaking at 4 o'clock, as I was mentioning earlier. A little bit of an introduction before Walid comes out and shares. Like his Savior Jesus Christ, Walid Shubat was born in Bethlehem. Not too many people can boast that. Walid was a former PLO terrorist. I think some of you have heard his story before, either on CNN or Fox News or right here at this church in times past. He discovered that the Jews and Israel of the Bible were not someone to be hated, but when he picked up the Bible, and you hear about, you'll hear about that today, how God began to speak to him from his word, God's word. He has appeared on numerous broadcasts around the world. For us, most familiar, Fox News and CNN. He has a keen understanding of the Bible. Listen, a keen understanding of the Bible, and most interesting, and one that we may need to pay close attention to, is that of a Middle Eastern background. Ladies and gentlemen, our Savior Jesus came from the Middle East. Remember that. Though Walid was formerly a Muslim and a terrorist, he's come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. Now, his teaching today will demand that you have your Bible open. If you didn't bring a Bible, act like you have one, because you're going to need it today. And many of the things that we have westernized in Scripture... Walid's going to be bringing to you from the Middle Eastern view. And I've got to tell you, you will be stimulated, pay close attention, excellent Bible teacher, man of God. I love this dear brother. So please give a warm Calvary Chapel welcome to Walid Shabbat. Thank you. I heard somebody say something. Bless him. Huh? Bless you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, brother. I get a lot of blessings when I go to church. I say when I go speak at university events, uh, whoever hosts me there, they never feed me. When I go to Jewish events, they forget to feed me. When I go to Christian events, they overfeed me. It's great to be here. I remember last time I was here, I had to watch the video to make sure what I talked about because uh, I have about a hundred things to talk about. I can talk about for a hundred hours straight and never finish because the wealth of the scripture is so rich. Uh, and I always regret it every time I leave a speaking event because I say, boy, I sit down on the airplane and I look at my notes, I forgot to tell them this and I forgot to tell them that and I didn't tell them about this and that. And I didn't do my job right and I always, I'm always feeling bad as a Christian, you know. As a Christian, you should always feel bad. I know you should, they tell you you should feel good all the time. You can go to Joel Olstein and listen to this negative, positive messages and then you're supposed to be positive no matter what. Uh, but no, not so for a Christian, because I think there's two kinds of people in the world. There is the bad people who always think they are good. If you ask a person who's going to hell, uh, basically they tell you, I'm basically a good person. I know, I pay my taxes, I obey the traffic laws, you know. That's what they always tell you. You talk to a Christian, he always says, I'm not good enough. I didn't do enough. Boy, I'm unworthy. I need to work harder in my life. See, those are the good people who always think they're bad. The bad people always think they're good, and the good people always think they're bad. And I learned from the Bible when I began to study the Bible in 1993 that everything is in reverse, really. That God thinks in reverse of the world, and the world thinks in reverse of God. So when they see what God says and proclaims, it seems to be very strange to them. I mean, a woman, virgin, given a, a birth to a child, and... His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. It doesn't make any sense. He becomes the Redeemer of mankind. That he dies and it is God himself taking himself a body of a man, dying on the cross on the behalf of everybody. Whoever wants to believe in this shall not perish but have everlasting life. What a simple message. What a true message. But it doesn't make any sense. How could it be that somebody can die on the behalf of my sins? After all, they're my sins, not his sins. 
From a world perspective, the gospel message doesn't really make any sense. But from the Bible, it does. By the time I read the Bible, I began to make sense of everything around me. I began to see that every day I participate in a ritual that we all participate in. Every human on earth participates in this ritual once, twice, or three times a day. And that is eating food. We all eat food. We all kill an animal that is innocent, that had nothing to do with my hunger. What is it the cow's fault to die because I'm hungry? It had nothing to do with me being hungry. It is innocent. It is my fault that I'm hungry, not its fault. Yet it dies, an innocent animal dies, and innocence always must die in order for us to be sustained. Life can never continue unless an innocent dies. Always. So we have a whole world that rejects the gospel message. They reject the idea of somebody interceding on your behalf. If you reject the idea that an innocent must die on your behalf, then stop eating. Stop eating and maybe you can perish and leave us alone. But the problem today, especially in the West, that I go speak out all over this country, this great nation, and I get into the airports and I look at these books that are on the shelves and I see books galore. You know, you got uh, Christopher Hitchens, uh, God is not great. Well, I don't know. I mean, he should have a problem with his name. His name is Christopher, which means Christ bearer. I mean, he should have a problem with his name. He should change his name. You, th you see books like by Richard Dawkins, uh, the God delusion that we as Christians are all diluted. We're deluding ourselves You know the Christians are always the problem. It's interesting that all these books is simply poking and picking on only the Christians I can imagine Christopher Hitchens having the guts to write a book Allah is not great. I Don't know why they never write such a book how come I'm the only one that's saying Allah is not great? But they tell you that we all worship the same God. That we as Christians, we are divisive. We are a stickler over this whole thing about only Jehovah is the true God. I mean, all gods are the same. We all worship the same God. Even going to a restaurant and sitting down and the waitress would come. I mean, I was with my manager, Keith. I remember, it was a few weeks ago, remember the lady, the waitress, she comes over, we begin to talk about religion, says, oh, we all worship the same God. I mean, such a unifying creed, you feel embarrassed to say nothing, you know. You can't say, oh, no, we don't worship the same God. What? You're divisive. You call me divisive again, you're not going to get a tip. <laughs> but that's how they look at you. You're divisive. You sound divisive because... What is to God really is opposite than the world views things. It's opposite than the logic of the world. You are divisive. How could you say that Allah and God are different gods? You must be an Islamophobe as well. You're an Islamophobe. Well, if God and Allah are the same and all gods are the same of the God Buddha and everything else is the same, all lumped up you know, together with one deity, then can I go to a place where they worship Satan and they say, Hail Satan. And I say, excuse me, can I get into your congregation and say, Hail Jehovah. They'll throw you out. If Allah and God are the same, can I maybe take a poster with me and take a trip to Mecca? And my poster will say, Allah, Jehovah, Buddha, we all worship the same God and carry it in Mecca. I know you Americans are not used to what I'm talking about here. You think, well, Mecca, big deal. He can go to Mecca and carry a poster. Before you get to Mecca, Mecca, big deal. He can go to Mecca and carry a poster. Before you get to Mecca, there is a big sign on the freeway, four arrows, you know, the big fat lanes. It says, Lil Muslimina Fakat, which means only Muslims. And there is a little arrow on the right, very narrow lane, that says non-Muslims. 
So if you want to take on my challenge, you want to go to Mecca and carry a big poster that says we all worship the same God, Allah, Buddha, Jehovah, whatever. May I suggest that you take that, fat, that narrow lane and take that exit very quickly. Because if you go take the wide lane and you go to Mecca, by the time you take your poster out and they see you, that Allah and Jehovah are the same God, boy, you're going to get your head on a pendulum, crescent-shaped pendulum, you know, and it's going to fly rolling. But you know, some say that when you're decapitated, you can still hear. Maybe you remember my words, and then you invite Jesus in your heart. Don't worry that your torso is separate from your head. God will unite the two together in the end when you rapture. But we don't worship the same God. It is totally a different God. Because by the time I began to look at the scripture and look at the definition of who God is in the Bible, I began to see that your God is totally opposite from my God. I began to see that your devil was my Allah. And my Allah was your devil. Simply the name is switched a little bit. It's in disguise. I began to study the verses regarding Antichrist. And boy, I was crushed. I found out that my Mahdi, my Messiah, the spirit of Muhammad when he comes again, that was your Antichrist. After all, by the time I read Daniel, and it talked about, well, how do we recognize the Antichrist? The Bible tells the sheep that he will bring seven years of peace. He will usher in seven years of peace. I said, boy, our Mahdi is in their Bible. How nice. In Islam, we believe that the Mahdi will usher in the last seven years that is remaining in the world. Then that's it, it's the end of the world. And the same thing with the book of Daniel. The last seven years, the Antichrist ushers in these seven years, and in the midst, he will break the treaty with Israel. In Islam, it was the same thing. He breaks the treaty. The Mahdi breaks the treaty because the stones in the trees will cry out. There is a Jew hiding behind me. Remember the hadith? I shared it with you last time. Muhammad said, the day of judgment shall not come to pass until the tribes of Islam defeat the tribes of Israel in Jerusalem and the surrounding nations. And then the trees will cry out and the stones will cry out. There is a Jew hiding behind me. Come, O Muslim. Come, O servant of Allah. Come and decapitate him. Cut his head off. And the Western Christians, when they read their Bibles, they go through the verses so quick that they miss all kinds of things. And I saw the martyrs who were beheaded in the name of Jesus. Every jot and every tittle in the Bible must be fulfilled, including the beheading part. Everything. But I began to see that I was on the wrong side. God in the Bible loves Jews. Allah hates Jews, J double O double O Z. He loves Jews, and over there he hates Jews. I began to see that Islam as a religion came as a polemic. It really came for one reason and one purpose alone. Here's the purpose of Islam. The purpose of Islam is to destroy the concept that God is a trinity to destroy the concept that Jesus died on the cross to destroy the concept that Israel is God's chosen nation and people that's it look at the whole Quran look at the whole hadith everything evolves around this whole concept the Quran says Qul huwa Allahu ahad Allahu samad lam yalid wa lam yulad wa lam yakun lahu kufuwan ahad God does not beget any sons. He's not been begotten, neither he begets. He has no son. The Trinity in Islam is an anathema. Just as you have in the Bible, the denial of the Holy Spirit is an anathema. 
Islam's Holy Spirit is the angel that visited Muhammad. He took upon himself a title that belongs to God because the Holy Spirit is really, in definition, is God himself, part of the Trinity. The angel that met with Muhammad called himself Gabriel. He also called himself the Holy Spirit. It was called, you know, the, he, there is another angel that came to Muhammad calls itself Al-Buraq. It is a flying being, sort of an angel kind of thing, that ascended Muhammad into heaven. Muhammad ascended into heaven to meet up with the you know, hosts of all the other angels and to meet with the prophets and the patriarchs of the Bible and things like that. Why was it necessary for Muhammad to ascend unto heaven? Because he wanted to fulfill what Jesus did. Only Jesus ascended to heaven. He came from heaven and he ascended to heaven. Most Americans, when they read the Bible, they look at the five eyes. I will be like God. I will ascend into heaven. I will go. Those are the same things that the Antichrist is talking about. Because if you look at Isaiah 14, Isaiah 14 in reality, I hope you brought your Bibles with you. A soldier without a stinger missile is very ineffective. Look at Isaiah 14. Because the West, when they look at these things, they say, well, this is the pride of the devil. This is when Satan was proud. This is the five eyes. But they don't look at this in context. Verse 12, how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. O Hilal ibn Sahar in the Hebrew. Hilal ibn Sahar, the Hebrew, go to the Hebrew, is really a name for this person that he is addressing. Hilal is an Aramaic word, Hebrew. Uh, uh, it's also Arabic word. Uh, anybody speaks Arabic here? I know Kamal speaks Arabic. Kamal, what is Hilal? Crescent. Crescent. Son of the morning star. That's his nickname. His nickname, oh, Crescent, brightness, the moon. Son of the morning star. Then he goes to the five eyes. I will ascend, verse 13, into heaven. That's what you proclaimed. You proclaim that you ascended into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. The stars, what are stars? Stars allegorically are angels. I will become above all angels. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will be like the most high. And then look at verse 16. If this is... Lucifer in his angelic form and his rebelliousness in heaven, then tell me what do you do with verse 16? Verse 16 says, those who see you after he's captured will gaze at you and consider you saying, is this the what? The man who made the earth tremble. Earth to America. This is not talking about just the devil in his rebelliousness. This is talking about the Antichrist himself. Reading this as a Muslim is much more shocking than it is for you as a Westerner. Because as a Muslim, I came from the alien world. I feel like Captain Spock. I know how the aliens think, but I'm coming here to tell all the Captain Kirks what is the problem that they don't understand this manuscript and those parts of the manuscript is regarding us, the aliens. So Captain Spock to Captain Kirk, open your ears. Is this the man who made the earth tremble? It's speaking of the Antichrist. But as a Muslim, we believe that the spirit of the Mahdi when he comes to usher in those seven years in which the end will be the, the destruction of all the Jews, in that spirit, what we believed is that this is Muhammad coming is Muhammad coming back again. Because Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, he says the Mahdi will come. He will have my spirit. It's the same person. I know most Westerners think when they think of this thing called Mahdi, they think of Ahmad and Nijad coming to the United Nations. Ahmadinejad spoke at the United Nations and he was talking about the ushering of the Mahdi. This is not theory anymore. They're talking about this stuff. 
And you might think, well, this is the 12th Imam thing. Most Americans ask me these questions all the time. What is this 12th Imam thing? Forget the 12th Imam thing. There's different schools of thoughts regarding the Mahdi within Shia. But let me tell you something. Every Shia and every Sunni in the world believes in the coming of the Mahdi. The belief in the coming of the Islamic Mahdi is as the belief for a Christian as the coming again of Jesus Christ. So can you tell me how many Christians claim to be Christians don't believe in Jesus coming again? All Muslims across the board. In fact, sometimes I take a few Captain Kirks with me and show them the reality. One time I spoke at a church and I went to this coffee shop and there was a, a rabbi and a pastor. It was an Israel event thing, you know. And they were talking to me and they said, you know, we've been coming to this coffee shop all our life. The owner is the Palestinian Arabs and they were so wonderful to us. They're so nice and we had never had a problem. So the waiter comes, he's from the Middle East, and I began to talk to him in Arabic. I said, Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as -salam. I said, okay. I began to gossip about these two Captain Kirk sitting in the table. I said, what do you think? You know, I've never seen something like this. I mean, a rabbi with a priest. Can you believe that? What do you think of those two guys? When you speak in Arabic, you'll get the truth. Forget what they say in English. Rule number one. You got to get what they say in the Arabic. I said, what do you think? Uh, the Prophet Muhammad says that the day of judgment is going to come and they're going to kill the Jews and cut their heads off and this and this and that. What do you think of these guys? He says, yes, we will cut their heads off, but we have to wait for the coming of the Mahdi. What did he say? He said, what he said basically is that enjoy the services here. We have hamburgers, french fries, cheeseburgers, steaks. <laughs> You're not on the menu yet. <laughs> Even the most moderate of all Muslims. I was sharing a uh, platform with uh, Mr. Woolsey, ex-CIA, just the other day. And they're always looking for this moderate Muslim. Everybody's looking to find a moderate Muslim. In search of the moderate Muslim. This is a book I should even write. <laughs> I had debates with moderate Muslims galore. I was at a synagogue on Yom Kippur. Judah Jasser. He is a prominent doctor who speaks as a moderate Muslim. And I remember he finished his speech, nice speech, Mr. Jasser. I uh, took him aside, began to talk to him a little bit. I says, Mr. Jasser. Did the Prophet of Islam kill the Jews in Saudi Arabia? Now, remember, every question I ask is a Jesus-style question. You're in checkmate. If, so, if I ask you today questions, realize ahead of time, you're in checkmate. You can't answer the question. I learned that from Jesus. And you ought to learn it too. It's a very good habit. Did Muhammad kill the Jews of Saudi Arabia? If he says no, then he's no longer a Muslim because he denied what Muhammad did. He denies the hadith. He denies the annals and the writings of the Islam and the Quran and the hadith. He's no longer a Muslim. Of course, he had to say yes. Question number two. How do you justify it? How do you justify it? He says, well, we all know they had a fair trial. I said, how interesting. How interesting. Europe came to confess that the Jews had no fair trial. Everybody in the world became to confess that Israel had no fair trial except the Muslim world. Even a moderate Muslim. The lie number one is that there is something called moderate Islam. It doesn't exist. Mr. Woolsey, the CIA, just last week, he says, what about Qabani? Another name he throws in, Qabani. Qabani, he's a very moderate Muslim. I said, no, okay, I'll send you some stuff. Qabbani wrote a book on the Islamic eschatology. Qabbani talked about how we're going to usher in a khilafah, which means the vicar of Muhammad on earth. Qabbani wrote about Armageddon. Qabbani wrote about the coming Mahdi. But the Qabbani, who, this, who basically criticizes the terrorists in America, it's because they criticize them because they should not do anything now. They have to wait till the usher schools of thought. Some say Osama bin Laden is good, some say Osama bin Laden is bad, 
because Osama bin Laden should wait for the coming of the Mahdi. So when the Mahdi comes, guess what? All your so-called moderate Muslims are no longer moderate. Good luck. Is that how you wanna, is that who you want to stand with? Is that your hope? Is it moderate Islam? There is no such thing as moderate Islam. But why is there moderate Islam? Why is there this whole hoopla and talk about moderate Islam and Islamic democracy and what have you? Well, you have to look at the Bible. Because I'm not interested here to come to you today and talk about Islam or bash Islam or bash Muslims. I'm here today to talk about what the Bible says regarding Islam. Nobody talks about the subject. Everybody talks about terrorism, they talk about it in genetic form. Secular speeches, secular books. You go to the bookstore, you buy secular books on Islam and what have you. But there, not, there has not been any books written regarding what the Bible says regarding Islam. This whole concept of the Mahdi, the Antichrist, and how to witness to Muslims from a biblical perspective. So I began to work very hard. I began to write how Muslims become Christians. If I sit down with Brother Kamal and we talk about the Bible, we talk about the Bible a little different than you. Because we see your Antichrist as our Mahdi. After all, you look at the world today, they say Islam is a peaceful religion. Islam means peace. Your President Bush said the same thing. In fact, President Bush said, we worship the same God. I was stunned. I don't worship the same God. If we worship the same God, then why did I have to leave Islam? Do we worship the same God? In fact, you Americans could have peace with Islam in an ins in a, instantly. You know, you know how you can have peace with Islam? I'll give you a peace proposal that will work 100%. Fourth of July, all the Americans go to the stadiums, the biggest stadiums in your cities. On fourth of July, all the Americans in unison will say, we want Osama bin Laden's peace proposal. What is Osama bin Laden's peace proposal and Ahmadinejad's peace proposal? And every single Muslim clergy, the peace proposal for the Americans is this. That if the Americans say, there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger, you'll have peace. How many of you want to say there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger? Raise your hand. Why are you so anti-peace? <laughs> you want wars for not wanting to utter a statement? I mean, how bigoted is this? You're all bigots. Amen. You're all bigots. <laughs> and excuse me, do you think if I sat down the Richard Dawkins of the world and all these anti-Christian writers, Christopher Hitchens and all these Christian phobes in the same hall right here and offer them the same offer, do you think they, they will raise their hand? They won't. They will not raise their hand. They will not accept there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. Why? Do you know why? Because we're Americans, no one tells us what to do. That's it. We're stubborn Americans. Why are we stubborn Americans? I don't want anybody to tell us what to do. Because our grandfathers bled for this land and they bled for the freedom to express what you want for this land and they bled for the freedom to express what you want, including So now that we're both bigots, whether you're liberal, whether you're conservative, I began to accept this title as a badge of honor. I am a Christian, American, fundamentalist, Islamophobic, Kafir, bigot, and a xenophobe.
but so are you. It doesn't matter whether you're Christian or not. Because if you want peace with Islam, raise your hand. Say, there's no God but Allah Muhammad is a messenger. But why do we Christians have a problem with there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger? I found that out when I went to a church for the first time, began to speak, and had, fell in love with this song. The song talked about Jesus coming in the clouds. You know the song? There's no God like Jehovah. He coming in the clouds. Anybody can sing it for me? Riding on the clouds. You don't know it? There's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. There's no God. You don't know that song. You guys need to learn that song. <laughs> Behold, he comes riding on the clouds at the trumpet call, the year of Jubilee. You know the song. And then it says, there's no God like Jehovah. 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 I said, wow, I love this song, but for different reasons than you love it. Because it says there's no God like Jehovah. It doesn't say there's no other gods. There's claiming gods, but there's no God like him. And Jesus is coming on the clouds, riding on the clouds, coming down to earth. I remember getting on the pulpits and began to ask, because I see your songs different the way you see them. I see the Bible a little different than the way you see it. I asked a question. I said, do you know when Jesus comes on the clouds, what is he coming to do? Anybody wants to tell me? Come on, raise your hands. You thought there's no quizzes in my class? You're wrong. <laughs> test the spirit. Test the sheep. I test everything, including you. What's Christ doing riding on the cloud? I know judgment. You always give me such generalized answers. Judgment. What? You were in the first service cheating. No problem. It's in Isaiah chapter 19. Isaiah chapter 19. Behold, the Lord rise on a swift cloud and will come into Egypt. Excuse me, why is that significant? Because I am not talking about a battle with a Muslim nation per se, something happens before Jesus comes. No, no, no. I am talking about a battle in which Jesus himself is participating in a war with Egypt. A specific country in other words Christ is coming down to earth to pick a fight with the Egyptians why because they were messing with Israel so when Christ comes again he's coming on the clouds to fight a Muslim country can you imagine me as a Muslim began to read this and I go wait a minute every time I talk to Christian Americans I asked them about this Jesus stuff. They tell me that Jesus is a teddy bear. He loves you. He loves you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, they're always like peppy and groovy and kind of like, Kamal says, they're like foofy Christians. I said, but reading this, the guy is no teddy bear. The guy is a grizzly bear. And I don't want to run into that guy. You think it's only one incident. Did you know in the Bible, in every single context where Christ is on earth, he is fighting a Muslim country. But the problem, by the time I wanted to reach to the Western mindset and tell them, wait a minute, Jesus is not fighting an Italian. He's fighting Muslims. The door shuts and they don't want to hear it from you. Because they don't want to be confused with what the text says because the books are already on the shelves. Because the Western mindset, when they interpret the Bible or prophecy, if I say we're going to have today Bible prophecy lesson, the first thing that comes into the Western mindset is this. Oh, we are going to study the book of Revelation. 
Why do you Americans always like to start from the last book? It doesn't make any sense. How do you understand all these allegories without looking at the literals? The literals are volumes. So much to talk about the literal parts of what the Bible talks about regarding what Revelation talks about. So you go to Revelation and you begin to read. Woman riding on a beast, having seven mountains and, you know, all these things. Seven mountains. Let's see. Hmm, this looks like Rome because Rome has seven mountains. So all of a sudden, Rome is in judgment. I know what you think. You're looking at me funny. I know. You're thinking these things. That's, and the EU, you got the EU, that's the Antichrist. The EU began to join into this uh, movement when they began to reestablish a, a European Union. I think you know what I'm talking about, right? You know what I'm talking about. Come on. The tenth nation joined was Greece. I remember, even as a Muslim, I knew about that stuff. When Greece joined as a tenth nation, I said, I bet you them Christians think that's the Antichrist. Sure. And they were all over books galore when Greece joined the tenth nation. That's it. We got the composite of the Antichrist. The end is coming near. All the American prophecy buffs began to write books that the end is near. We have the ten nation confederacy. The EU is it. Then eleventh nation joined and twelfth nation and thirteen nation and fourteen and fifteen and sixteen. The EU is growing. Twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two. We got 22 toes of that statue of Daniel chapter 2 all protruding from the Western Roman Empire with no toes from the Eastern Roman Empire. Man, that looks like a strange feat. If it doesn't fit, you must acquit. <laughs> but no, the Antichrist must come from the EU. That's it. So you go back to the drawing board, you don't know what to do, and you begin to make it fit somehow. Maybe they the 10, the G8. Ah, oh, the G8 now. Oh, I know what you're thinking. It's the G8. The Pope is going to set up guillotines in Rome and begin to cut heads off of Christians. While the real people who are cutting the heads off are getting away with it. Because Islam is a peaceful religion. Let me tell you something. I can stand here till I'm blue at the face talking about the EU and talking about the papacy. I can pick on the Pope day in and day out and guess what's going to happen to me? Zippo, nothing. No one's going to pick a fight with me. Catholics don't come to kill you if you pick on the Pope. The EU's not going to come and kill you because you're exposing them as the Antichrist. They look at you as crazy. The real Antichrist is the one that you begin to talk about. That you risk your life. As a Christian, the real Antichrist is something that you're not comfortable talking about. That's the real Antichrist. So you're thinking when you go to the Bible Sunday school, you're studying these things as just something to know. Oh yeah, it's neat. You sit at home and you go home, you come back to service. Wow, how neat. We learned this and we learned that. And you think your whole walk as a Christian is that Jesus bless me now. I know what you Westerners think. That whole concept of Jesus is to bless you abundantly on earth right now. If it's not true what I'm saying, then why is Joel Osteen's church filled? The biggest church in America. Coming there to think about the positive message and the negative message. When the two words positive negative doesn't even exist in the entire Bible. When the two words positive negative doesn't even exist in the entire Bible. Whole doctrines are made up. And you've ignored the Bible when it said that before the coming of Christ, the falling away must come first. So if you're in the midst of the falling away, look around. Thank you. Christ said, I send you a sheep amongst wolves. What is that supposed to mean? Nothing? He sends you a sheep amongst wolves. So if you have 
no wolves in your life, maybe you're not sheep. I don't know why you're laughing. That's not a joke. If you're not a sheep, then join us. And leave us alone for a change to say that Allah and God are not the same. It's not easy to be a sheep. Christ also said, be as wise as a serpent and as innocent as doves. Now, I could never work on my dove part. I try hard. But I'm part of the bad people. I don't think I'm good. But I know all about serpentine wisdom. Because I've lived it. And I've seen it. I saw how my father treated my mother. I saw how in Islam they treat women. Antichrist, after all, he says it doesn't desire women. Is that what you Westerners think? Antichrist is a homosexual, you know? He's one of those. Because it says in the text he doesn't desire women. Where did you come with such a strange concept? The world's going to elect a homosexual? Antichrist is not one of those. It says he doesn't desire, he doesn't honor the desire of women. Excuse me, women, what's your desire? He doesn't honor them. Whatever your desire is as a woman, anything, he doesn't honor it. He don't give a darn about women. Can it be any clearer? Why can't the text just say what the text is saying instead of you putting words in the text? He will attempt to change times and laws. Well, what is Islam? Well, it's a religion. No. Sure, it cloaks itself under religion. Islam cloaks itself with religion. But Islam is Sharia law. Look it up. Sharia law. Sharia law to be instituted throughout the whole world. Wait a minute, Walid. But Antichrist is an atheist. No. False. Daniel chapter 11 is very clear regarding who Antichrist is. Let's go there. Take out your stinger missiles. Get ready. We're going to study the Bible. Look at verse 37. The amazing thing about Daniel when I read it as a Muslim is that the whole concept of Islam is put right there in two verses. Everything. It's so amazing. In verse 37. First of all, we all know that Antichrist, he honors a god of fortress. How does the Antichrist honor a god of fortress? Verse 38. God of war. Who honors a god of war? What is a god of war after all? What's jihad? You know what jihad is? War to honor Allah. Americans, welcome to jihad. Welcome to hudna. Hudna is a peace treaty in Islam that's offered to non-Muslims. Hudna is not even called a peace treaty in Islam. It's called ceasefire treaty. Do you know in Islam, there's no such thing as peace treaty. It doesn't exist. Why? Because Islam forbids to have a peace treaty with non-Muslims. Why? Because Islam as a concept has to be propagated throughout the whole world by the power of the sword and the war to advance Allah's glory over all the gods, especially Jehovah. Especially the God of the Christians. Especially the God of the Jews. Because the God of the Christians, they believe in the Trinity. You don't understand that stuff. Trinity is the most anathema in Islam. Trinity is the most holiest thing in the Bible. God forgives everything except blessing the Holy Spirit. If you deny God as the Holy Spirit, you ain't going to heaven, pal. 
God is the Holy Spirit. Not the angel that Muhammad ran into who claimed that he was the Holy Spirit. That's blasphemy. In 1 John 2.22, who is the liar? He who denies that Jesus is the Christ. He is anti-Christ that denies the Father and the Son. Only Kamal is shaking his head because he gets it. He knows. Because Islam as a religion came for one reason alone, to deny the Trinity. So how important is the Trinity? It's a major doctrine. Because God visited mankind through the Son. And then He gives you the Holy Spirit. So He dwells with you. So He guides you to the truth. The only way to reach to the truth is through the Holy Spirit. I prayed in the name of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to show me the truth. When you do such a thing, you've dialed the right number, and the other side answers, and he gives you the truth. That's how it works. You seek him with all your heart, your soul, and your might, and he will reveal himself. I began to see as I studied here, look what it says. He shall regard, verse 37, neither the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women. We talked about that already. He doesn't honor the desire of his fathers, the God of his fathers in ancestors. Muhammad denied the gods of the ancestors, of the pagan gods, and he established a god, a single god. Americans think that the Antichrist is a Jew. I said, show me one verse in the Bible that confirms Antichrist is a Jew. They say, well, there is no verse that says Antichrist is a Jew. I said, well, give me some, you know, evidence. Circumstantial evidence, any evidence. Here's the circumstantial evidence Westerners give you that the Antichrist is a Jew. Well, he doesn't honor the God of his fathers. Since it's a singular God, only Jews worshipped a singular God, so it has to be a Jew. Excuse me. Muslims also honor a single God. And that God they honor is a God of fortress. Jews don't honor a God of war. So that seems to fit. Ah, hold on, Mr. Shubat. Hold on. You have a problem. There's a flaw in your theory. How is the Antichrist going to fool the Jews to sign a peace treaty? Because for them to trust him, he must be a Jew. I know what you're thinking. I've been with you, hanging on for a long time. It drives me crazy. Excuse me. They sign a peace treaty with the answer, Arafat. <laughs> he honors a single God and it's a God of war. They sign a peace treaty with him. Why shouldn't they sign a peace treaty with Antichrist? Bunch of baloney. These arguments don't hold any weight whatsoever. You make these arguments, I don't know where you get them from, but they hold zero weight. Walid, come on. The Bible talked about Antichrist coming from Europe. Give me a verse. Here you are, a thousand of you, and there is one of me. It should be a fair debate. Come and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Let's reason, right? You Westerners lack reasoning. I didn't used to reason before. I become a Christian. I learned that the first thing you have to do is to reason, not this. So let's reason. Who is to reason, not this? So let's reason. Give me one verse in the Bible. Give me one verse in the Bible that God wars with a non Muslim country. One verse. Anywhere. Where? Show me the verses in the Bible that says God is going to usher in this Antichrist from Europe. It really doesn't exist. I know he's looking at his wife over there. Wait a minute. Rome, seven hills, seven 200 million man army, China. Come on, Wally. China's in the Bible. 200 million man army coming from China. Why is it in the West that when you have a discussion over prophecy, Words are entering into the text that never were in the text. 
China was never in the text. Why didn't you introduce it in the text? When you argue Bible, the first thing you need to do from an Eastern mindset is bring the exact quote and the exact words. And when you treat the word of God, it's like you're going to court, you know? Objection, Your Honor, you know? It's not part of the text of the law. Overruled. Or Honor, I have DNA evidence. The DNA evidence rules over the circumstantial evidence. And the whole Western paradigm regarding Antichrist is all the circumstantial evidence getting the most weight of the argument. Do you know that? It's all the circumstantial evidence. Because there are 200 million man army, so that must be China because of the number of the people. How do you draw such conclusions based on no evidence? First of all, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, it says kings of the East. Not one king, many kings. China is only one king. So how did you make kings one king? Kings rule kingdoms. There are several countries, not one country. If there are kings from the East, there are several nations under their kingdoms. Not one king, many kings from the east of the Euphrates. Remember, they're coming through the Euphrates, right? So if they're coming through, through the Euphrates and there are many kings, that means there are many nations. Second of all, hermeneutically speaking, if there is a fulfillment of a prophecy, it must always take precedence over the one that is not fulfilled if it has the same kind of context. We have kings from the east, or wise men from the east in the New Testament, coming to worship the king in my village. They came with incense, frankincense, and myrrh. You know the story? I'm talking by myself, you look bored. They came with frankincense, incense, and myrrh, and worshipped the king in Bethlehem. All scholars agree that these came from the regions of Persia, Babylonia, and Arabia, and what have you. Guess what? Today all these are Muslim. Oh, hold on, Mr. Shabbat. There's 200 million. Where are you going to bring 200 million man army from these countries across the Euphrates? Excuse me? Let's go across the Euphrates. There's Iraq, Iran. By the way, these are declaring war already on you. You don't have to wait for the EU. Pakistan, Afghanistan, Indonesia. I can muster easily, not 200 million man army, I can muster 500 million man army. How's that sound for a challenge? Try to refute that one. And guess what? I got all the evidence to back my theory because it's already happening. Ahmadinejad comes to the United Nations and he makes a speech praising and praying for the ushering of the Mahdi. The perfect man. Is that not an antichrist? And what about those verses where Christ fights? How does that clock work? I got one minute and 43 seconds because before explosion. Is that all I have? No. Strict Americans, wrap it up. <laughs> gotta wrap it up. Wally, you gotta wrap it up when you're up there. That's all I hear is wrap it up, wrap it up. <laughs> Even the restaurants, wrap it up. In Joel chapter 3, God comes to fight Midian. In Joel chapter 3, here's Christ himself coming to fight Midian. All right? What's he doing coming to fight Midian? In, uh, sorry, in Habakkuk 3. Habakkuk 3, he comes to fight from Mount Paran, from Timan. Timan is Saudi Arabia, did you know that? What's Christ himself fighting Saudi Arabia? Isaiah 63. Who is this who comes from Edom with his garments sprinkled with grape juice? You know that one? Is, is that grape juice? He tells him no. It's blood. Why is it blood? I went over there to Arabia to kick some behinds. 
Naturally, he says it that he's going there to destroy the Arab world himself. Why do you Westerners change the word Edom to Rome? What gives you that right? Well, we have that right because we assume that the seven hills of Revelation is Rome. Because after all, Rome has seven hills. So, once we looked at an allegory and concluded that allegory means Rome, all the literals must be Rome. How is that hermeneutically correct? How dare you take an allegory, make it the literal, and ignore the, uh, the literals where Christ fights these nations? Isaiah 63, who is he who comes with his garment sprinkled with blood? All over. Psalm 82, arise, O God, judge the earth. He's judging them. Joel 3, I will gather all nations into the valley of Jehoshaphat, and I will enter into judgment with them there in the cut of my people, my heritage, Israel, whom they have gathered among the, uh, you know, scattered among the nations and they divided up my land the division of land will usher in christ's judgment and then you continue in Joel 3 he's talking to tyre and to gaza lebanon come on sorry your people are doomed he's coming to fight tyre lebanon and gaza my turf too i wasn't immune either i'm from the palestinian areas and he says who are you to mess with me O tyre and Sidon, and all the coasts of Philistia, Gaza, Hamas, and Hezbollah are there. And you see the stuff happening. And he's judging those two nations in that very context of judging the entire nations. He doesn't forget Hezbollah and Hamas. How amazing is that? You live in a time, my friends, that Moses would dance in joy. God brought Israel out of the land of Egypt 3,000 years ago. But Jeremiah said, the day is coming, saith the Lord, when no longer the children of Israel say that God who's brought the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but God who's brought the children of Israel out of all the lands where he has driven them, out of the land of the north and all the lands where he has driven them. From 100 different nations, God brought the children of Israel in front of your eyes. When you read the Bible as a book on stories, Forget it. The Bible is not a book on just devotion. The Bible is not just a book on stories. The Bible I began to understand as a Muslim was a book on the destiny of mankind. I've taken psychology 101, sociology 101, English 101, but I've never taken futurology 101. This is futurology 101. What an amazing document. It's not even a document. It's many documents. Come tonight. I know the thing says zero. <laughs> this is the vegetables. Tonight there will be the T-bone steak. <laughs> Bring your Bibles. If you don't have time to come and eat T-bone steak, then I have books outside on the table that talks about this in detail. Why I Left Jihad speaks about the prophetic parts. I have another book coming up, which is the most extensive book done in history regarding what the Bible says about Islam. That is, I put my heart in that book, it's coming up, but if you want immediate information, it's in Why I Left Jihad. And there's also videos, I know Americans don't like reading, he comes to me, Americans don't like reading, we have to do something. Video, video, video. So we made a series of four videos that talks about the whole thing in detail. By the time you finish watching the video, trust me, you'll throw the old model out. You'll bring the new model in. God bless you. Thank you very much.